Hello, everyone. Today, we are joined by senior advocate Dushan Tave, who is known for his open and bold views on various issues. He is not someone who hesitates to call a spade a spade. And today in this interview, we'll be having a discussion on various recent developments of the Supreme Court. Welcome, sir. Welcome to the interview. So there are certain concerns raised by a lot of people, including former judges and civil society members, about some of the recent orders passed by the Supreme Court, especially in the Zakia Jafri case and also the Himanshu Kumar case, where the court, by uh, while dismissing petition seeking probe into Gujarat rights and also the uh, attacks against tribals in Chhattisgarh, has uh, observed that uh, there should be some sort of criminal prosecution also against the petitioners and the other parties involved. And this has given rise to a lot of concerns uh, regarding the, the, the deterrent effect which such orders could create on citizens who are questioning the government action before the government, before the court. Because see, it's not always easy for a citizen to establish a case against the government, especially in high profile matters. So sh or should there be a criminal prosecution against petitioners in all such cases? What could be a fallout of uh, such orders? What do you think? So? Well, let me begin by discussing uh, Tista Sitelwad's uh, you know, episode. Uh, the fact is that, and I'm, I think I'm deeply disturbed by the judgment of the Supreme Court ordering prosecution against Tista uh, uh, Srikumar and uh, Sanjeev uh, uh, Bhatt. Uh, I think uh, Supreme Court has sent terribly wrong message. Uh, what Supreme Court has effectively done is to shoot the messenger, in, uh, you know, which is not really in a uh, good, uh, you know, news for the democracy and the rule of law that we have in this country. The fact of the matter is, and which is what Supreme Court has completely ignored, that the acts did take place. I mean, uh, let us forget accusations against uh, then Chief Minister Sri Narendra Bhai Modi. Uh, you know, forget that. I mean, let's not go into that. But the riots did take place. The fact of the matter is that for five days, the army was not called out. And as a result, on account of large scale violence, thousands of innocent men, women and children lost their lives. Now, uh, undoubtedly, the police had failed to prevent the Godra carnage in the first instance. The police should have been careful because they knew Godra was a sensitive railway station. Uh, they could have taken precautions. There were enough indicators that uh, the violence was likely to break, whatever be it. But the Godra incident, uh, if it was not prevented by the police, in the first instance, the police officers responsible in Godra should have been you know, proceeded departmentally, which was not, never done. Then the violence takes place. And the fact of the matter is that uh, under the orders from the highest uh, level, the unfortunately, the uh, Kursevaks who lost their lives, the innocent Kursevaks who lost their lives, their bodies were you know, taken into processions before cremation in many towns and cities uh, you know, uh, in open uh, you know, uh, uh, way, as a result of which thousands of people uh, joined uh, you know, the cremation party. And after the cremation, the violence broke out immediately. Now, I mean, any government uh, with its, uh, you know, sense uh, and responsibility would have ensured that the cremations take place as quietly as possible. And the, uh, you know, unfortunate Karsevaks are given respectful burial, I mean, cremation uh, as per the Hindu rites. Uh, far from doing that, their, uh, their bodies were allowed to be virtually paraded. Uh, and uh, that, uh, you know, aroused the uh, passions of people across the state. So violence did take place. Nobody can, you know, deny the fact of the violence. Now, compare that to the 1984 violence, which was also uh, quite well organized. And it, uh, you know, resulted in deaths of thousands of innocent men, women, and uh, children amongst the Sikh community, especially. Now, uh, if in both these cases, in, for example, in 84 riots, the civil society did not, at that point of time, immediately come to the help of the Sikh community. And it was much later that many courageous uh, Sikh lawyers like uh, Mr. Fulka and others, you know, came up and started helping. Uh, I have also appeared in those cases and helped the Sikh community. So at that point of time, it was a great, I would say, complete vacuum to support a community which needed support from the civil society and from the activists. As against that, in 2002 riots, the activists, you know, uh, came up 
and they really uh, helped. Uh, one of the people who really did wonderful work initially was Mr. Harish Salve himself. I mean, in many matters, he was a minus related to Gujarat riots, and he was assisting the SIT, and the SIT did good work, and many uh, you know cases which were closed were reopened uh, uh, by the Supreme Court and by the uh, High Court, and that led to fresh investigations and fresh trials and fresh convictions. So, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, and Ms. Tista Sedalwa, I mean, I know it as a fact, was constantly in touch with the SIT and Mr. Salve for a long period of time. And uh, she did a, I mean, she did a remarkable service to the society. Now, you know, for the Supreme Court to, uh, you know, order prosecution of Ms. Sedalwa is not only unconstitutional, but I would say it is highly immoral. And uh, it really sends a terribly wrong signal uh, because uh, this is not part of the function of the Supreme Court to have done so. In fact, the Supreme Court should have praised her efforts. It's all right. I mean, if she failed in persuading the court uh, to put you know, blame on uh, uh, a particular political establishment, fair enough. The court uh, can rightly come to that conclusion that her accusations were not right. But that does not mean that she should be hanged. So this is something which has never been done. The Supreme Court has really crossed all lines, all limitations, and all sense of propriety in ordering prosecution. And I, I think it is, I, I, I feel terribly sorry that uh, the, the lady, I may or may not agree with what she was doing. But the fact is that it is very sad to see for us lawyers that an innocent citizen has been, and what is this charge that Gujarat was defamed? I mean, uh, no state can be defamed by an individual. I mean, uh, all that she did, after all, you know, Muslims are also citizens of this country. And if one section of citizens were discriminated against by the state, uh, then, I mean, we have every right to come to their help. And uh, nobody can be, you know, uh, I have appeared in large number of cases. I'm appearing in demolition case uh, tomorrow only. So, I mean, somebody will suggest that we should all be taken to task I mean, I, I don't think uh, Supreme Court has done uh, service to itself. Rather, it has done great disservice to itself by uh, passing these orders. And I hope uh, and pray that some sense prevails uh, in both the executive and the judiciary. And Mr. Setalwad and uh, as Mr. Srikumar are released as quickly as possible. Uh, if I mean, every day's detention, to my mind, is unconstitutional. And it sends, uh, I think, a very, very wrong message. You have taken away liberty without due process of law. Right, sir. Right, sir. Uh, quite strong words by you, sir, regarding the Supreme Court's judgment. And in fact, the Supreme Court itself in the judgment uh, uh, did observe that like mere failure of state machinery that cannot be uh, considered as an element of uh, conspiracy. But people who are seeking investigation, they can only present certain matters, certain circumstances which warrant or which may indicate a need for investigation. And and it's not always uh, tough for it's not always difficult for a uh, not easy for a citizen to establish a case against uh, the state because uh, all the documents evidence etc. These need to be collected by the investigating agency. See, and the, uh, uh, Supreme Court may be right in saying there was no conspiracy. Fair enough, but the fact of the matter is that both in 1984 and in 2002, the respective governments of Congress and Bharatiya Janata Party failed in protecting the lives of thousands of innocent citizens who, lost, who were killed mercilessly. So you can't run away from that, that there was a gross failure on the part of the state machinery in Gujarat in not coming to the aid of the people. Because everybody, I mean, I knew within hours of Godra carnage that retaliation is to take place. I myself had requested many friends in power in those days that please make sure that no retaliation takes place and the army is brought out as quickly as possible. So, I mean, I, I, I did speak to my late friend, Mr. Arun Jetli, about it also. So, I, 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 there is no denying the fact that there was a failure by Congress in 1984, a miserable failure in, by Congress. And again, the BJP failed in the, uh, 2002. So, I, I don't think for that, and yes, you may say that there was no conspiracy, fair enough. But you can't, uh, you know, for that, uh, you know, the fight on behalf of the citizens by activists, uh, I mean, tomorrow you might say, take action against all these people who are appearing the, you know, to support the Sikhs. Now, I mean, that, that's not good. That's not good for every vibrant democracy needs activists. Every vibrant democracy needs critics. 
and everybody needs to stand up against you know any kind of injustices that take place uh, you know in society if we don't stand up for uh, you know uh, against the injustices to fellow citizens then some day the injustices will come to us so it's time that we should all stand up and fight against them nothing wrong about it and i think if anybody including supreme court thinks that uh, i mean standing up against injustices is a crime then i think uh, i mean it is very difficult to really understand what it went into the minds of the supreme court i it sends uh, i mean it really uh, speaks very poorly on the part of a great institution that we have uh, the supreme court of india which has done remarkable work it has failed from sometimes but it has also done remarkable work but this uh, failure is definitely very very disturbing right sir now sir another uh, major judgment which came recently was the judgment in the pmla cases where the supreme court upheld the powers of enforcement directorate and also various amendments made to the pmla act and this judgment has come at a time when there are several concerns about the use of ed as some kind of a political tool against uh, political opponents and also activists and there are certain various uh, criticisms and concerns raised by several groups and so this judgment has in effect reinforced the powers of uh, ed and some of the uh, findings of the court have uh, given rise to a lot of concerns that uh, the ed officers the ed officials they are not police officers and they are not bound by uh, the requirements of furnishing the copy of ecir ecir is not an fir and they can also record incriminating statements so uh, how do you see the uh, what is your response to this judgment how do you see the impact of this judgment well i can only say one thing that wherever i have gone in the country in last two weeks after the judgment was rendered whomever i have met whether in on the golf courses whether in restaurants whether on aircrafts whether in you know dinners i mean across the board people are deeply concerned about this judgment and they include business people they include bureaucrats serving and retired they include some uh, lawyer friends they include retired judges they include you know common man everybody is seriously concerned to my mind if i can say so the supreme court has weaponized the enforcement directorate and it has given them the handle which we know how it is being uh, you know abused uh, by the enforcement directorate for last uh, couple of years i mean are the judges blind to not see that the enforcement directorate is acting only against the opposition leaders is there corruption only in the opposition is there a single person from uh, from the bjp leadership across the country or their friends who have been even investigated much less arrested by ed i mean i is uh, are we to believe that there is no wrong doing uh, taking place in various bjp governments various municipal and other authorities that bjp uh, <coughs> controls are we uh, are so blind that we don't want to see the kind of wealth which is amassed by many bjp leaders across the country and their family members every you know corruption runs across the political parties are unfortunately it's now gone into our veins and it must be fought enforcement directorate must fight it but must fight it in a just manner it must fight without any discrimination everybody who has amassed wealth must be investigated i mean we all know what is happening in the country very few people are even willing to pay their taxes today and yet they live in palatial homes they drive in fanciest of the cars they spend uh, 100 or 200 crores in the wedding of their children all that the id is not seeing so i i i feel that it is not right uh, for judges not to see you see judicial notice must be taken by judges they can't say we live in ivory tower that that's the you know uh, that was in the good old days today judges are conscious of everything and therefore judges far from anything else get interpretation of the act which to uh, you know which to my mind is completely against the basic grain of criminal jurisprudence in every which way the judgment is completely it suffers from series of flaws but that apart i mean judges are entitled to make a mistake question is the judges if they had opened kept their eyes open and had seen what is happening in the country today what it is doing you want to destroy opposition by launching e and cbi against opposition leaders 
I have no sympathy for anybody who is corrupt. Let me make that very clear. But I am certainly against this targeting of a section of the politicians, and leaving aside the majority of the politicians who are not even being investigated. So I think what is troublesome is that the judges fail to see that and has have gone ahead and given this judgment, giving such extraordinary powers to the enforcement directorate, which are completely, you know, contrary to the fundamental principles of constitutional law, fundamental rights and basic human values. You just can't do this. And yet the judges have gone ahead and do it. So I, I feel that, uh, I, I mean, judges should have been deeply circumspect, deeply cautious, deeply concerned about the well-being of the citizens. Every citizen, however, I mean, even if he is guilty, he is entitled to the protection of the law. He is under the rule of law. And judges can't give this kind of extraordinary powers to an authority. We all know who are being appointed to these authorities. Hand-picked officers are being appointed. They are given you know, uh, long tenures. The present ED director, in fact, the Supreme Court uh, said that uh, uh, he, uh, we hope that his term will not be extended. And the government comes out with the law and gives him an appointment for five years. What does it show? So I think that, uh, I mean, for three judges of the Supreme Court, and particularly Justice Kandilkar, who has a vast experience and he knows criminal jurisprudence quite well, uh, I mean, I am really disappointed and I'm equally disappointed that Justice Maheshwari and Justice Ravi Kumar, uh, you know, agreed uh, to this uh, judgment. I, I think uh, the judgment uh, is uh, definitely a, a, a black spot on uh, otherwise, uh, you know, good work that Supreme Court has been doing from time to time. And uh, it will really be, uh, it will really be remembered for a long time as something that Supreme Court has given to the citizens, which it should not have given. It's, it's, a, it's a gift of, uh, I would say, suffering that Supreme Court has given. And uh, that's really very disappointing. Very, very disappointing. Right, sir. So, and sir, another uh, recent, uh, or not recent, a long-standing criticism against the Supreme Court is that uh, the outcome of uh, cases, they are dependent on which bench the case is assigned to. And uh, in fact, even during the Prashant Bhushan's contempt case where you are appearing for Mr. Bhushan, you had raised this point that uh, certain cases are not assigned to certain judges and certain cases, especially some politically sensitive cases, they are assigned to certain benches. And this really kind of impacts the outcome of the uh, cases as well. So does this point uh, or does this signify a need to revisit the master of process system to bring some transparency or... How do you, uh, how do we? Look, I, I, I feel that as the Chief Justice, as the master of the rooster, should have no power at all to assign any matter to any bench. The process must be completely automated and it must be so automatic, so computerized that no human hand can really touch it. And it is only, you know, as per the, yes, Chief Justice can decide the constitution of the benches. Chief Justice certainly can decide the allocation of subject matter uh, to those benches. But once having done that, the computer must automatically function and uh, you know, go on uh, sending the uh, matters according to computer's own you know, interpretation. Uh, human intervention, whether by registry or by Chief Justice, is extremely disturbing. I mean, how else do you explain that nine judgments of one of the largest corporate houses were delivered by a bench presided by Justice Arun Mishra. I mean, despite my letter in 2019, June, uh, by which time four matters were sent, after that five more were sent by Chief Justice Gogoi. What does it tell you? And when Chief Justice Gogoi's, uh, you know, this so-called book was launched, he welcomed, uh, you know, that particular uh, head of the corporate uh, entity with his family to his book launch. What does it tell you? I mean, it's, it's really disturbing to see that this kind of incidents and events can take place and everybody in Supreme Court wants to shut their eyes. What are these judges doing? The, the Supreme Court comprises of essentially good judges. Why are the good judges silent? I mean, is the Supreme Court a particular bench meant for a corporate house? So, I mean, this thing is happening for a long, long time. I, I do remember uh, long back 
uh, when uh, uh, Kerala's former chief minister was, uh, uh, you know, indicted or something, uh, so he was facing. Uh, uh, Chief Justice Balakrishnan said, in those days, the matters were being assigned only to first five benches uh, uh, on mentioning. And the, the matter was sent to some court nine or ten. And, uh, you know, uh, immediately uh, interim order was granted. I mean, this is happening time and again. Time and again, it's happening. It's not just Chief Justice. The registry, I must say, also has to really be careful. There is a there is a there is a growing you know feeling amongst a lot of young lawyers, advocate on record friends, that their matters do not get listed for months and months on, and the matters of certain you know powerful advocates on record suddenly get listed. Sometimes even though from the same judgment, the other advocate on record has filed a petition in Supreme Court much earlier. Now you know, and and then this this all things send extremely wrong message. But despite repeated assertions by us, uh, you know, the thing is that there is, I mean, as, as president of the bar, every time I spoke to chief justices, and I must say that Chief Justice Thakur tried to correct the system quite uh, remarkably. And uh, there was a lot of interaction. He even created a kind of a, a, a judges and a lawyers, uh, you know, group uh, for uh, grievance redressal. Uh, unfortunately, the, the moment he stepped down, the next judge, you know, did, did not care for that grievance redressal, uh, you know, mechanism. There must be a mechanism. Today, judges are absolute masters. And the bar has no way to tell judges what is happening. I had to say the other day, in a matter appearing before a particular bench, I won't name, but in a matter, I told the judges when they were a little, you know, upset at my outbursts. I said, you come and sit on this side of the bar and find out what's happening in the registry. So, I mean, these young lawyers are indeed suffering. The genuine litigants are indeed suffering. The powerful litigants sometimes get, you know, a quicker a slot and sometimes favorable slot. So uh, all this, I, I think, is something which I, I really wish that uh, in the, uh, because I have tr great hopes, uh, I had, I mean, I, I, I thought that Justice Ramna would perhaps uh, try and correct the situation. I, I, I must say that on, at least on allocation of matters, just, Justice Ramna has not been able to do much. Uh, although in many other areas, he's done some very uh, good work and he has been definitely a revelation after four uh, successive chief justices failed the country and the citizens. But I do expect and I do hope and pray that Chief Justice Lalit and Chief Justice Chandrachur and then Chief Justice Kanna and many other Chief Justice coming will, you know, act immediately to stop this, what is happening. I mean, you just can't allow this kind of situation where corporate houses are just able to succeed in every case that they argue before the Supreme Court. It's not done. It's not. I mean, then it, I mean, if their success rate uh, is let's say ninety or ninety-five percent, that really, <laughs> that really is his uh, eyebrows. Why should it happen? I mean, it, it, and I, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, sometimes it uh, you can't talk many things, uh, you know, in these kind of interviews. Uh, but uh, uh, privately, there is so much to tell to the chief justices as to what is happening, which you know some of us are aware factually, uh, but we are not able to share and the, I, and there is no way we can share it with the judges. I mean, there must be some interaction where judges must know what is happening, what their brother judges are doing and uh, how they are damaging the institution, its reputation. And I must say one thing that people at large are, uh, are definitely talking about the failure of the Supreme Court in imparting justice in an impartial way. People are talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, selective uh, benches uh, being, uh, uh, you know, uh, constituted or matters being selectively sent to certain benches and all that. Uh, even, uh, you know, people who are unconnected with law, I have heard them talk about it and ask me questions at various places across the country. And I have to defend my institution. So I don't talk much because I mean, you love the institution that you have been with for 44 years. 
but uh, i think judges must uh, give us the opportunity where we can have a heart to heart talk with them and tell them that the rot has set in to such an extent that unless they move in quickly i don't think we can ever correct the situation so sir while you were the president of the supreme court bar association uh, did you get any opportunity to raise uh, these issues before the uh, chief justice i i i must say that i raised it with every chief justice who was there Uh, during my uh, uh, stint, uh, Chief Justice Thakur and Chief Justice Thakur responded very, very positively. Whenever I pointed out uh, uh, any you know transgressions, and I must say, even the Secretary General uh, in his time, or even subsequently, uh, you know, uh, when uh, uh, Chief Justice Bobde was there, uh, although Chief Justice Bobde uh, was uh, quite disappointing, but the Secretary General. a uh, time and again i would pick up a phone when a junior uh, member of the bar would uh, ring me up and complain about his matter not being listed although urgent although filed long time ago i would just give the number to them and they would immediately ensure that the matter got uh, listing so I, i i used to do as much as i could i mean there are limitations as president i mean as president we don't meet chief justice just like that we can only meet on certain occasions we can only but chief justice thakur had certainly given absolutely virtual open access to me as president and he said that any uh, matter of the bar that you want to discuss mr dave you are welcome to come and discuss with me and uh, that is how you know i could get the bar uh, you know the uh, bar room for the first time in 75 years i could get a fantastic canteen for the bar i could get a litigants lounge the first time in the history of supreme court nobody thought about litigants till i became president nobody thought about litigants we could have the larger uh, you know ladies bathroom we could uh, you know do uh, we could uh, complete the housing complex for the uh, lawyers at greater noida all that the chief justice thakur was constantly of help constantly and any kind of a issue one could discuss with him that somehow and even with the bar i mean this grievance redress committee my colleagues in the committee uh, my uh, vice president late mr shekhar uh, ms aishwarya bhati the secretary and senior members uh, we used to go and have a uh, you know fantastic dialogue with uh, uh, senior judges from j2 to j6 and uh, have all kinds of free uh, discussion about many issues there was no hold bar discussion and the registry top officials would be present and immediately they would be instructed by them to take corrective or uh, you know uh, 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 reformative measures so it was a fantastic time at that point of time but uh, uh, with chief justice bobde uh, not once did he uh, you know agree to meet even my committee and uh, it was an extremely disappointing uh, experience so i mean it's i hope uh, things change uh, sooner than later right sir and recently even judges are also expressing their unhappiness with the registry because the cases are get, getting deleted from the list despite their own uh, orders for specific posting and uh, recently last last week two judges they expressed in open court that cases are getting deleted and they had come prepared and despite that the matters got deleted and i i will i will give you a simple example most of these judges have come from the high courts some of them are appointed directly from the bar all of them are conscious of one fact and one fact mind you in every high court in the country you file a matter it will be listed in 2 3 4 days in most high court like gujarat the matter would be listed next day with urgent listing and most matters will definitely come on the notice returnable dates unless process fee is not paid in a given case but it never happens the courts you know have complete control over their boards high courts the supreme court is singularly a failure and these very judges who have come from high courts many of them have been chief justices of high court yet are not either willing to take corrective measures or are completely wanting to ignore them they know the problem the young and not so successful members of the bar face huge problems see they have one or two briefs in a month they must have access to get their matters listed within a day or two or three 
not some powerful advocate on record who files some 50 matters a month these these young men and women they really need the support of the institution their clients need justice what face can they show to their briefing lawyers from the states what do they tell them i i think it's really I, I, it's shocking that the registry officials are completely oblivious to this pain being suffered by young members of the bar or not so successful members of the bar and judges just don't want to help them no chief justice wants to help uh, these people except justice thakur as i told you uh, in my uh, recent memory i mean things were much different when for example when chief justice venkatesh chalaya was chief justice you could stand before him to court and mention anything and he would immediately order you know uh, uh, something uh, uh, for the help even with chief justice amadi i i have seen that you know all these chief justices were extremely responsive to the needs of litigants and you know the the uh, needs of the uh, bar they were uh, alive to their problems recently in last 10 15 20 years i feel that they are somehow just just you know blind to this uh, problems i mean people have such huge issues litigants need justice so quickly they you you don't give them justice what happens what happens so why can the system work in high court and not work here i mean if the master of the roster the chief justice of high court is also the master but he does not interfere so much maybe in a highly sensitive matter he might you know assign it to himself or something but otherwise things just happen normally there is a roster there is a subject matter and the automatically the registry sends them just walk across 2 kilometers down the road to delhi high court you never have problems so i think judges will have to seriously introspect on this issue <laughs> if they don't introspect i think um, uh, the supreme court will come under more and more criticism which is not good for the institution it's a great institution and it needs to you know uh, face these problems solve them so that we, uh, the respect that it uh, is entitled to command the respect which it did command is really uh, uh, continues to be commanded by in times to come right sir thank you so much for sharing your views and speaking very openly about the pressing issues faced by the supreme court let's hope that uh, your voice is heard across and leads to some positive changes thank you so much for your time thank you sir